The Carpathians, one of the most beguiling and mysterious regions on Earth. Over the centuries, it spawned countless legends and inspired sinister depictions of a place often viewed through a darkened lens. But as we showed in episode one, the reality of this preternaturally beautiful mountain range is very different from the fevered imaginings of Bram Stoker's gothic prose. Here is the last great wilderness in Europe, where predators like wolves, bears and lynx still roam freely and traditional rural cultures survive despite the rush to modernize. This time we follow the southern arc of the mountains, from the Iron Gates, a deep gorge carved by the Danube, and heading east through national parks, past hot springs, ancient citadels, monuments, wineries and medieval villages. We rejoin the Danube on the other side of the mountains, where it branches like an enormous tree to form its dendritic delta. On the way, we will see very different environments. The Carpathian Mountains, home to the largest concentration of old-growth temperate forest in the world, and by contrast, Europe's most expansive wetland, a vast reed-covered haven for rare and exotic fauna. An edifice less likely to collapse anytime soon is this concrete leviathan, a communist-era construction that, like a Russian doll, hides deep in its belly a priceless treasure, the original Roman spa. A building within a building, these baths are almost unchanged from the days when legionaries and centurions alike immersed themselves in their healing waters. The fame of the springs was such that it spawned a legend from which the town took its name. Baile Herculani, or the Baths of Hercules, was alleged to be the place where the son of Zeus stopped to freshen up, before heading off to tackle the Hydra. A fight so monumental that the serpent's death throes wrung great gouges from the bedrock, the evidence of which you can still see an hour's drive further upstream. It is from these lofty heights that you can truly see the scale of the wilderness. This sea of green that stretches to the horizon contains Europe's last great expanse of pristine forest. Sadly, you can also see the extent of its ongoing destruction. Below the tree line, much of the forest has already been lost, in part due to the restitution of land to private individuals who then harvest the wood or sell on the logging rights. I am on my way to meet one of the most outspoken of these landowners, a well-known figure who works tirelessly to address this and many other social problems, Princess Margarita of Romania. Restitution and private property, for me anyway, this is where I'm coming from, is absolutely essential to a modern democratic state. But having said that, I think that the restitution process was badly done. First of all, it was done in dribs and drabs. It was done in a chaotic manner and it's led to chaos, just what you're talking about, the deforestation, corruption, selling of wood on the black market, illegal logging. If people can get away with wreaking absolute havoc, then they're going to keep doing it. First of all, you need a good legislative framework, you need a good body to enforce that, and then you need sanctions and incentives, obviously. You're not going to just punish people, it's ridiculous. And there are quite good laws, but they're not respected and they're not enforced. This has to be done if we want to get anywhere. As it nears the sea, the Danube divides into a labyrinth of channels, a vast reserve designated by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. If Ceausescu had had his way, all of this would have been drained and converted into farmland. Instead, 
It remains the largest wetland area in Europe and one of the most biodiverse regions on the planet. The Danube Delta has been described as the Amazon of Europe. 2,200 square miles of rivers, canals, marshes, reed-fringed lakes and sandy islands. This eulogenous Eden harbours over 300 species of bird and 45 different types of freshwater fish, providing a critical habitat for many endangered animals and plants. The biggest influence, both in terms of its destruction or salvation, once again, is us. The exodus of inhabitants is dwarfed by the annual influx of tourists. As with some areas we've seen, unsympathetic development is burgeoning, while riverbanks and waterways are being damaged by speeding traffic. But there are people and organisations working to save this watery paradise like an initiative to encourage a more harmonious approach to exploring the Delta. I caught up with founder and former Olympic canoeist Ivan Pitsaikin, for whom this region has always had a personal significance. Popularity has been the most important thing that I have learned to take care of my life, and I have learned to take care of my life in the Balta, with my grandmother, with my grandmother. Eram în vârful bărcii, așa. Și asta mi-a rămas foarte plăcut, impresionant. Școala, îmi plăcea la școală să merg, pentru că de foarte multe ori la școală trebuia să mă deplasesc cu barca. Toate lucrurile astea erau pentru mine normale, iar în nicio clipă nu m-am gândit că voi ajunge și în sport. So now you've moved back here and you're involved in various projects. What are you doing? This is Proiecto Romania, which promotes a tourism land, which promotes traditions and culture in the zone, protects nature, accepts tourists who respect this promotion. As the Delta finally merges with the Black Sea, this part of our journey comes to a close. Over the last hour, we have seen many contrasting environments, all of which are fragile, stunning and irreplaceable. Romania is a country of epic beauty, boasting Europe's largest surviving area of virgin forest and its greatest wetland. But these are not just worth preserving for dry academic reasons. <laughs>